Welcome, and uh, congratulations. The fact that you are here means that you've made it to labs. And uh, in the past, we've had quite a bit of backlog of students because we've had a lot of influx and our, our capacity was reached. And what I'm finding now is many of you are getting through the program fairly quickly, which is great. And the more diligent you are with registration, the more quickly you will get through as well. The other thing that I'm finding is that our prerequisites are working. In the past, we do orientation, and many of you wouldn't have sanitation. Many of you wouldn't have the English, the math, under your belts. And what I found last night is that everybody did. So quick raise of hands, how many of you have had the three culinary prereqs, English and math, already? Anybody that hasn't? So there's nobody here that's been grandfathered from the old programs, program, so that is excellent. What that means is that you're all going ahead with the knowledge that you need to be successful, and that's why we have these orientations. There is a lot of information here, folks, that I'm going to go over, and I realize that I'm going over a lot of information, and I realize it's probably early in the morning, and you're not quite in school mode, so try to hang with me. I'll answer questions. I'll pause several times for you to think about it and ask me questions. Uh, and I want you to leave here knowing exactly what you're getting yourselves into, exactly what your expectations are. Um, you know, when you get emails from us, a lot of you responded, a lot of you went online, and you registered. That's awesome for this orientation, you registered. A lot of the students that are on that list, unfortunately, didn't. And that worries me. That's the whole reason we have this orientation is because you are now responsible for yourself. In high school, there may be somebody watching. There may be somebody saying, you know, that person needs this or that person needs that. I'm going to make sure and send them to counseling. I'm going to make sure and give them extra support. In college, that really doesn't happen so much. You have to be your own advocate to be successful. And if you're not your own advocate, very often nobody's going to do that for you. So this whole orientation will hopefully give you the key to help you get through the program well. My name is Dan Gendler. Probably should have done that earlier. I'm the program director, so many of you I know already know me. Actually graduated from here about 30 years ago. Didn't know anything about anything as far as food goes, except I love to cook. I was actually in aerospace aeronautical engineering. Did that for a year and realized that I just could not do that. I needed the hands-on, I needed the interaction, I needed the excitement and movement. And more than likely, that's why all of you are sitting here, because you're that same kind of person. You're not somebody that wants to sit in front of a computer all day long. You're not somebody that wants to do book work or sit at a desk all day long. You want to be involved in whatever you're doing. That's what this industry is about. And luckily, with the media and what's happened the last 10 years or so, this industry has exploded. So you are in the right place at the right time for the right reasons. So now we just have to make sure you've got the right skills leaving here so you can be successful. What happened with me is, because I didn't have industry experience, I had to get into the program and try to learn the industry at the same time. And what we found over the years is actually that's the best way. Now we don't recommend that you get a full-time job while you're trying to go to school now that you're in labs, because you're going to be in labs for five hours a day, five days a week. That's 25 hours. More than likely, you're also carrying some lecture classes. And if, if everybody's true to form, your homework should be twice as long as the amount of time you're in class. So, or for the credit hours. So if you're in a five credit hour lecture class, excuse me, lab class, and it's a 12 and a half contact hours per week, theoretically you're going to get 10 hours of homework. If you're taking another three to five credits to, to be at 12 to 15 or 18 credits full time student, theoretically you're going to get another six to 10 hours of homework. Do the math. You're going to be here for about 35 hours a week. You're going to add on 20 more hours of homework, you're going to wind up with 55, 60, 70 hours worth of schooling alone. That doesn't include your job. So just be aware that now that you're into labs, it may get a little bit intense for you. It may be an adjustment period. You may want to back off on your job a little bit just for the first couple of weeks so that you can get acclimated and be successful. But the thing is that we did find if you don't have a job, I do recommend trying to get your foot in the door as something. And if you have absolutely no experience like I did, get a dishwasher job, get a prep cook job, a salad prep job. It doesn't matter, but get yourself in a resume building situation which will help you in the future. I know it helped me because otherwise, when I went to interview at Marriott at the time, and at the time it was Chef Norbert Dill, 
who is kind of a famous German chef who was running Schnitzelbank for years ago, and most of you probably don't remember it, but he looked at me and looked at my resume and went, are you kidding me? I can't take a chance on you, but I'm in a culinary program. I just won gold medals at state competition. Yeah, but what do you know about you know, cuisine and prep and you've got nothing? No, I don't. So I wound up taking a very entry level job. So going through the program, getting all A's, being on the competition team, going to Culinary Olympics, receiving gold medals in Lansing and Detroit, best to show over professionals. I did all that. Anybody guess what job I took when I graduated? Yeah. Dishwasher, cashier, but it was also at Steelcase, which at the time was the place to be. But the thing is, because of my education, because I had gone through the paces, I had worked at a little hotel and I did a prep cook there and I worked myself a line cook, because I had built my experience during the two and a half years I was here, I was able to very quickly move up from that dishwasher job to associate chef and very quickly after that to executive chef. A little bit of luck because the position opened up, but I was in the right place at the right time, but I also had the experience and I had, I had shown them what I can do while I was at the dishwasher. I didn't just dishwash. I would get done, catch up, and go off and help the chefs. I'd do some prep. I'd do some cleaning. I would do everything. That's kind of what it takes. This is still a very apprenticeship-based type of industry, so you've got to be able to attack it. And our whole vocational educational program is kind of built around that mentality. The more you do, the more you go after in this program, the better you will do in this program. So after that, Steelcase executive opened up, executive chef opened up Sanchez, still own that after 20 years. I've been teaching here for seven, and then got the director's job a couple years ago. As you probably know, if you've been here as long as I have from the director's job, you've seen changes, lots of changes, and we'll go through some of those when we go through this program. All right, so these are the things we're going to go over today. We're going to talk about what is SICE, because I think it's important to sell the company to the company. In this case, I'm going to sell the program to the program, to you, because you need to know what you're into. You need to know about the program. How many of you did the orientation with me before you even started the program? So a few. So some of this might be a little bit of a repeat, but I'm going to go over it again anyway. So we're going to talk about what our programs are and, and how to navigate through them. Uh, course requirements and prerequisite, we're probably not going to talk about that because the fact that you're all sitting here, none of you raised your hand about not having prerequisites. You already know what those are, so that makes this a little bit quicker. We're going to go over the handbook. We're going to go over our advising plan because now that you're in it, you may need some direction and some help from the chefs, and we are going through some extensive advising training with them. How many of you have learned or used my degree path? Ooh, not as many as last night. Okay. I will have to show you a little bit online about my degree path. It's really important that you get yourself involved in that so you can start planning out your program, your degree, and see what classes you need and what classes you don't need or you've already had. And then we're going to go a little bit over sustainability. I'll try not to get too much on my soapbox about being a tree hugger or green. It's more because it's the right thing to do, it's cost effective, and if you learn those tools in your industry, you as a chef or you as an employee for your chef will make money for that operation. It's that simple. It's, it's no longer about just being green. It's about being efficient and making money or saving money. Okay, so just a little bit about what is what are we? We're nationally known. We've been nationally known and nationally ranked literally for 30 years. Um, when we first were formed, um, the first in Michigan, the fourth or fifth in the United States, um, excuse me, the 19th in the United States. Um, we were fourth or fifth accredited in the United States. But back then, there were only a handful of programs. There's 650, 700 programs now. So it was a lot easier to be number one in the country back in 1988. We were the number one program. It was a lot harder to do that now, but we're, we've still been in the top 10. Just in the last five years, we've been rated the best post-secondary culinary program, the best value, the chef to chef rated a six in the nation. And not only that, but when the ACF came in here, they do accreditation every seven years. They just got done in February. It was our fourth seven-year accreditation in a row. 
on top of our initial accreditation. And there are different levels of accreditation. What normally would happen is these evaluators from all over the country, and in this case, we had the person that was in charge of Purdue, the person in charge of Columbus State, and a sergeant first class from the military who is in charge of the apprenticeship for the military. These are all top guys in their fields, all running top programs in the country. Every single one of them was blown away. It happened to be on a snow day when they had to do the evaluation. And we couldn't meet here. College was closed. So we had to meet at the Cornucopia. And it was a 20-minute meeting. Usually these final meetings, these recap meetings, can last an hour or more because they have to go through all the things that are wrong with the program and tell you how to fix them. They still credit the program after that as long as you prove that you fix them in a certain amount of time. But it's very detailed. And there's no discussion. These say, this is what it is. You can't defend yourself. You can't say, no, that's not right. It just is what it is. These folks came in and said, we've got nothing. You guys are an exemplary program. We've never seen such organization in the classroom. We've never seen so much um, professionalism in dress from the students. We haven't seen the hands-on that your program offers. The way your kitchens are laid out because of our, not our pod system, but our station system. We've got real lines in our kitchens. A lot of culinary programs have gone to those pods. Those pods don't teach you how to cook on a big line. Our program is set up the way the real industry is set up. Um, I can't remember if it was Columbus State gentleman or the Purdue gentleman, but one of them said, I wish my students were that good. That's something. Add on top of that, on the way to the airport when I'm driving a sergeant, there's a sheet of paper that they give you that is off record. It's things that they'd like to see you do and improve. But it doesn't go on the record because it's, it's like when the health department comes in, they have to find something wrong. They can't really tell you you're 100% or they're not doing their job. Same thing with accreditation. And that was the sergeant's job. And, he's, and there were some weird things on this sheet. And, and you don't question. They tell you you can't question. You don't get to ask or tell or anything. You just say, yep, thank you very much. We'll take care of this and we'll look into this. On the way to the, the airport, off record, he says, yeah, sorry about that sheet. I had nothing. They said I had to come up with something. So he took any little nitpicky thing that he possibly could find and put about 10 points on that sheet. He said, you really don't need to do anything on that. Unheard of, OK? So we've done that for four times in a row, 28 years in a row, plus our initial accreditation, over 30 years. Only two culinary programs in the nation can say that, and we're one of them. So that's the kind of program you're now attached to. That's the kind of degree that you're going to have. You add to that our faculty, which try to find all master degreed chefs at a community college in this nation, or for that matter, a private college. They may be chefs, like our chefs are, but they're very rarely educated to the master degree level in vocational education, technical college education, and education itself. And of the 12, we've got two master chefs. Of the 10 left, um, eight our master's degree in education. It's pretty much unheard of. So we've got that, you've got the accreditation, you've got the faculty, you've got our facility, which keeps getting better and better, our new three quarter of a million dollar amphitheater that you're probably having some demos and things in. And then our value. Um, we'll talk a little bit about course fees, but even with the course fees, which will add about $2,500 to tuition overall, you're still talking about a degreed program of under 20,000 if you're in Kent County. You compare that to these programs, uh, even our closest neighbor like Baker College, where they're pushing 40, 45,000 for the same degree. And then you talk about Kendall College or CIA or Johnson and Wales, and you're talking about anywhere between 60 and 70,000. You talk about California Institute with a really good reputation, but students are coming out of there with $100,000 in tuition for the same two, two and a half year degree. So for those of you that are not in Kent County, how many do I have? That's a little different now, right? Because now, because of college tuition, it's over doubled. So you may be pushing 40,000 on your tuition. You may wanna try to do the math. It may work out, it may not. I figure some about 50% of students, when they sit down and say, well, wait, if I move into Grand Rapids for six months, I can save 20,000 in tuition. It only cost me to get a, a roommate about 10 grand a year. I could save 10 grand. Some folks, well, I'm living free right now. There's no sense in me moving. It's not going to save me anything. 
Do the math though, sit down intently and see if it's worth moving for the next two years or so while you complete your degree. You may save $10,000 or so depending on your living situation. So that is SICE. What are our programs? It's the, the four that are up there and um, these are links within this PowerPoint and all this is gonna be online. So some of this stuff I'm gonna go through pretty quickly so I don't lose you, but keep in mind that you can always go online and click on these links to the PowerPoint and find it or it's on our website or it's on our Blackboard site. So I'm just gonna real quickly, go over one of these links. Most of you hopefully have already seen this. It's the path that you can take. But the important thing that I want to point out is, number one, there are different prerequisites through this for sequencing. They don't necessarily show. So while you're getting into to registration, you want to know what you're going for and you want to know what the prerequisites are so it doesn't slow you down in registration. Because while you're trying to figure out what class you can take and what your prerequisites are that are needed, somebody might grab the class that you want and all of a sudden you can't get the schedule you want. So do all the work ahead of time. So in other words, when you're looking at CA205, that has a prerequisite of 114 and 115, which is why they're above there. If you don't know that and you're going to register, you may mess yourself up. On the other hand, if you've already taken CA104 and you don't want to take the next string of classes of 114, 115, you can jump all the way down to 204 because the only prerequisite for 204 is 104. You don't have to follow this sequencing, see? If you don't want to take 105 and 104, bakery and skills right at first, and you want to take 115 first, you can. And then you can jump all the way down to 245. As long as you have the prerequisite, theoretically in your very first year, you could take a second year class and this first year, second year class and skip some of these first year classes. And that's important to know because sometimes the classes do fill up and I don't want you to come to the registration table and say, darn it, my classes are full, walk around way upset and lose a semester of progression. Just start working down this list so when you have the prerequisites, you get the next. Now the other thing that you wanna know is that any of these classes here, no, no, not there, there. Anything that has two or three credits, you can take at any time. So you can, again, you can jump down all the way down here, get your English out of the way, get your poli-sci out of the way, okay? CA 180, two different paths to think about that. Number one, you can take it in the summer, right after 104, 105, which is skills and, and bakery, which probably most of you are in right now. Or you can take it later when you get more experience, and that's up to you. Folks that wind up taking Chef Campbell and Chef Schultz wind up getting a personal connection with their chef so that possibly they can get a pseudo recommendation or at least they will have an interview or an introduction to that chef. In, for instance, Chef Campbell is not gonna go out on a limb and say, yeah, I'm gonna introduce you to the executive chef at St. Andrews in Scotland to see if you can get a job if he has no idea what your skill set is. There's a very specific skill set that needs to happen out there. Same thing with Chef Schultz and those Hawaii jobs. I mean, every year, Chef Schultz has between eight and 12 people go to Hawaii. Chef Campbell has between eight and 10 people go to St. Andrews in Scotland. We have people in Lake Tahoe, California, Florida, Colorado, New England, in that whole area, uh, Maryland and, and uh, Maine, uh, Rhode Island. Um, anyway, I could go on and on. Chef Schultz has about 200 positions across the country and the world that he has chef connections for. But he's not gonna introduce you to somebody if he doesn't know your skill set. We're not gonna set you up to fail. So some of the folks who know what path they wanna take, they've either got a connection somewhere or they, they wanna stay local, right after, right after skills here and bakery here, you can take this class the next summer. But for some that want a little bigger experience or a little more out of country experience, then you would wait not take the 180 in the summer, wait till you've had Chef Campbell, Chef Schultz, and then take it the following semester, either the following summer or the following semester. The other option is take CA 180, get it out of the way after you've had the 105 or 104, and then just go after a stage or a job the second year 
It wouldn't be a class. It would just be because you want to get out of the country kind of thing. And Chef Schultz and Chef Campbell will help you with that as well. We've got several people that will do their, their co-op locally, go through the program, nearly graduate or will graduate, and then interview with the executive chef in St. Andrews. And then because they have no restraints, will stay instead three or four months, will stay six or eight months. It's totally up to you. But those are some options, okay? I just don't, I, main thing is I want you to understand you don't have to stick strictly to this path. Questions on that? Questions about the co-op process? Okay, we'll get a little more in detail as I hit, go through the handbook on that co-op process. So I don't have to talk about prereqs because you're already through it. Don't have to talk about culinary prereqs because you're already through it. Contact hours versus credit hours I probably want to touch on. So you pay by contact hours, but you get credit for credit hours. Credit hours are more based on academic content. Contact hours is how long you're in the class. And the only reason I mention this is because sometimes when students go to the table, go to registration, they go to pay, they're shocked because they didn't realize that it's going to be $1,250 a class for in, uh, county tuition because it's based on 12 and a half contact hours, not that five credit class. And every single lab class from here on out is five credits, but it's 12 and a half contact hours and you're paying by the contact hour. So if you're taking two labs in each semester, you can count on that $2,500 plus tuition bill, okay? So just be aware of that. And that's going to happen from here on out if you have two labs and there's, if you're in the culinary program, there's four semesters, eight labs total that you'll have to do. Okay, these next slides are just an outline of what is in the handbook. So what I'm going to do is go through these very quickly to show you the outline, land on a slide, then I'm actually going to open up the handbook and it'll go through the categories. That's where we're going to stall. Now, who has read this already? Because you took, it was in the, the prerequisite classes and you had to sign a paper online when you took your prerequisite classes. Who honestly really read it? Yeah, see, that's what I'm afraid of. And that's why I try to make you come into this so at least I know it was in your face at least once. Because here's the thing. Whether you read this or not, you will have already signed off that you did. And whether you signed off that you did or not, these are our policies. And so if you don't know it, ignorance is not a defense. Well, I didn't know if I missed four classes that I would get an E in the lab and have to retake it. Sorry, but we put it to you in several different ways. I know you may not have said that you know, but I still have to remove you from the class or you still fail that class. So we're going to go through this. I strongly recommend that you read it cover to cover so that you know what your responsibilities are because you will be held to them whether you soak it up here or not or whether you've read it before or not. It's really important. And I'm not, you know, I, I want to make sure you understand I tend to come across as the heavy. I come across, come across as a bad guy because this is the rules and these are the policies and this is what you have to do. And that's really not my intention. My intention is to create a standard of performance. My intention is to make sure that every single one of you leaves top notch in this industry. That's why we have the new grade requirements. That's why we have the prerequisite requirements. In the past, what people were doing is they would not take or pass English and they get into a very intense writing class in our coursework. They wouldn't have to pass um, sanitation, but they'd be expected to practice it in our lab work. They wouldn't be able to do math or forms and formulas, recipes, meat yield tests, and yet they'd be expected to do it in our purchasing class in our labs. And so all of a sudden, there's this huge chunk of knowledge that, that the students were having trouble with and failing, and therefore they would not be a great student. And we were, we were graduating students from our capstone classes getting D's. 
And if you think about it, if you're out in the industry and say, I'm a graduate of Secchi Institute, and you're applying for the job, and that chef says, yeah, I just had one of those guys, and it happens to be the person that graduated the capstone class with a D or a D minus, all of a sudden that makes you look bad, which makes us look bad. So that's why we changed this. It's not to be mean, but it's to raise everybody up to a standard to make sure that when you leave here and you've got Secchia stamped on your resume, it means something. It means regimen, it means that you know how to work, it means you have vocational skills, and even that is showing up on time for class and attendance. All right, so real quickly, the fact that you are all here, that's not cooperating. The fact that you are all here means that you've got your GRCC email account linked. Make sure you check that often because Blackboard's linked to that, I'm linked to that. How many of you have personally gotten an email from me? Anybody that hasn't? Because if you haven't, then that means that one of two things, you don't have the right program code, so make sure when you go into your student online center that you are in the right program. In other words, you've declared your right major. And those codes are 151, 155, 156, or 158. And those are the codes for culinary arts, culinary management, baking pastry arts, and personal chef. Make sure that you have that and make sure that you have your email working. And if you don't want to use GRCC email, that's okay. Get up to the computer lab and make sure it's linked to your Yahoo account or your Gmail account so that those things get pushed through to you because you are responsible. If you miss an email, something you're responsible for, that's not our concern. That's going to be your concern because you might miss an assignment, you might miss a field trip, you might miss a change of class time, any number of things. You have to be connected. Same thing with Blackboard. And those program codes you can see are right here so that you don't have to memorize them, but those are what you should do, and this is, this is how you get linked up. Culinary code, uh, it's coming from the American Culinary um, Federation, and some of the things that we expect, this is kind of the attitude, this is kind of the person that we're trying to build. Um, the way I put it in business is it's culture. You develop a culture at work, and probably all of you have been in a job where you just didn't like the culture of the place. You, it's either you didn't get along with the people or whatever, but then you probably have all been in a job where it's like, I just love coming to work. This place is great because it is this way. Well, that's what we're de dealing with here. We're trying to build a culture, and you have to be this way. You know what the root of culture is? The root word? Yeah, right? Cult. That's a little scary word, isn't it? We're all trying to make you into this cult. But that really is the case. You have to conform to what, what this industry wants and expects so that you can perform best. It's not necessarily a scary cult, but it is part of the culture. So the culinary code, the emphasis, um, and all of the uh, program goals. Again, I'm not going to read them to you, but if you want to know what you're getting into and what you should be leaving us with, these are all here. The fact that you're all here, we don't have to talk about eligibility because you're all here, so that's awesome. We've already gotten these C minuses and above. Culinary arts st technical standards. Hopefully you have anyway. I see some snickers. Somebody's gotten through. Anyway, um, culinary standards are the physical standards. You gotta be able to hear a certain way. You gotta be able to see a certain way. You gotta be able to lift a certain way. You gotta be able to move a certain way. At least according to the federal government for our job specific requirements. Now, does that mean that if you can't do one of these things that you're in trouble? Absolutely not. Our college is phenomenal. The more I'm here, especially in this director's job, the more I realize that, that we have so many services that students don't take advantage of that they could to make them successful. It blows my mind. So again, I'm not going to go over all this because it's several pages long and you can read it as much as I can, but if you have any issues or any concerns or anything that you think you should have help with, especially based on here, get to the uh, career counseling services and the student support services because they have amazing tools for you. If it's academic, go to the tutoring lab. We also hopefully will have some tutoring drop-in labs in our library. So we're going to support you on the physical side. We're going to help support you on the academic side. We're going to help support you on the student disability side as well. It's all a huge package and the college has so many ways to help you out.
Okay, program completion requirements. This is important. Part of this is college, part of this is SECI Institute. From the SECI Institute side, anything with a CA from here on out, you gotta get a C or above to pass. And a C is not 749 points out of 1,000. A C is 750 or more out of 1,000. So you can go through the entire class. So you're in this lab, and every lab now has a practical exam. So it's twofold. You have to pass the practical exam to pass the class, but you also have to do the academic work to pass the class. So you could be an A-plus academic student. You do all the tests in an amazing fashion. You do all the homework in an amazing fashion. You do everything that way. But then you're not so good with your knife skills yet. You didn't take the time to practice. You didn't ask the chef for help along the way. And this, is, this happens, and it happens all the time. It breaks my heart. So you get to that last day in the practical exam that has to be completed in two hours. You have to get an 85% or higher to pass the practical exam. If you go over two hours or you get anything less than 85%, you fail the practical exam which means you fail the entire class. And usually those practical exams are on the last day or so of class. So that means you spent five hours a day of your life, seven weeks in a row, you come to class the last day and you fail the entire class even though you're an A-plus student academically. Don't let that happen to you. Our chefs will help you all along the way. You can come in early, you can come in late, you can ask them what you need to practice on to make sure you're successful. There are practice runs for these practical exams. But make sure, again, you're your own advocate. You make sure that you take the, the time and the tools that you need to be successful. Flip side can happen, too. We have folks that absolutely can run circles around other students as far as kitchens go. Knife skills, cooking skills, knowledge of product. They can come in and get that practical exam done in an hour and a half, in and out, no issue. A+. Plus. Problem is, all throughout the seven weeks, yeah, they did some homework, they didn't do some homework, they didn't read the material, they didn't pass one of the tests. All of a sudden they get to the last day and they realize there's no way they can accumulate enough points to get that C in the course, even though for the most part they probably are a good line cook at that point. They fail the entire class. And the only way to, do, to take care of that problem after the fact is pay another $2,500, or if you're out of county, another $5,000, for the la oh, sorry, that's two labs, but you get my picture. Pay the tuition again and sit in class again for another seven weeks, five hours a day, five days a week, and take that class again. So please, take advantage of all the tools you have. Make sure you're studying both academically and skill set wise, and check in with your instructor all the time to make sure you're progressing like you should, okay? The other thing is, make sure you're there on your registration day. You probably are all at 36 or higher or darn close to it um, because what very often happens is you get complacent. You don't show up right at 8 o'clock for, for registration or you don't have your classes in a basket in your cart already and you go to register and classes are full. And at this point, if you miss a lab class, it literally will delay your graduation by an entire semester. Don't let that happen to you. Okay, co-op. I told you we would talk a little bit more about co-op. Um, again, you know when or where you can take it. It's up to you. But this is college policy. Because of protecting the college and the liability, there's some legal situations going on with co-op now. It's new as of this summer. We need to know where you are or we need to know um, who to call in case you get injured on the job because we need to have that information in case you need help. Because if you're over in Scotland and we hear from the executive chef that something happened and we don't know who to call, then we could be liable. The other thing is we don't want to take that liability, so there is a waiver. So basically you're going to say that anything that happens to me while I'm on a job in some other place and not at the college is nothing to do with the college, therefore I'm waiving all liability. So those two forms are on Blackboard on the departmental Blackboard, and I'll show you that in a minute. So you got to get to Blackboard, print those out, fill them out, and then bring them to Marsha. Now what Marsha will do, Marsha Arp, who is our secretary in our offices, will then enter you in the class because the class is now listed as departmental consent. So when you go to register for it, you won't be able to do it yourself. It just won't let you because there's that hurdle. We have to make sure that you've got that paperwork. The other thing is that you have to do the paperwork, register the class, and make sure you have um, a job 
and complete the work of that class all at the same time. I've had some really unfortunate situations where a student will travel to Scotland, work for four or five or six months, come back and say, okay, I want to use that for my co-op now. But they didn't register for the class, and they didn't do the work. I've had students go to Scotland, do the work for the class, but never register for the class. So there's no place for that work to go. They have to take the class and do another co-op. I've had students register for the class, take the class, not have a job, and then try to get a job in the future to apply to a class in the past. Don't do that, okay? And then the last thing, which really was rough, I had a student go to Scotland, register for the class, did everything right, but didn't take that personal responsibility to make sure the class was paid for. They messed something up with financial aid, they were dropped from the class, it was a student's fault, so they were in Scotland the whole year, they didn't check their email, they didn't check in with a college, they didn't check in with the instructor, and didn't realize they weren't in the class. I can't count it. They have to do it all over again. So three things, paperwork, registration class, classwork with the job. All three of those things have to happen at once. And all that information is online, which I will show you right now. So when you go into Blackboard, Obviously, we all know how to whoops, do that. I will. You'll see your courses, and then you'll see organizations, and that's where you're going. And this organization you're looking for is Secu Institute for Culinary Education. If you get an email from me, that's where it's coming from. I'm actually using Blackboard. So if you're not in this organization because you haven't got the right program code, or you're not linking your email, then you won't be able to get that, that notification. You also won't be able to see this in your Blackboard if you don't have the right program code. All these tabs are here for you. Everything that we've talked about will be under this program information. Orientation video, handbook, course sequencing guides and then the co-op information is here. And those forms are here, the rules are here, there's the things that you need to do, so if you don't remember, it's all right here. Other things that you'll find here are the scholarships, um, community info, industry information, contests and opportunities. Very often we post contests and they can be student oriented and students have won uh, basically money, scholarship money, um, resources, resources and tutoring, if you want to know how and where to find support, it's here. And then uh, information about our so uh, sommelier society, if you want to start learning about food and wine and uh, that kind of thing. And, and we're going to continue to add to this, so just be aware of that. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, grading and evaluation. Basically, I've talked a little bit about this already. Every class is different, though. Hopefully, you've noticed that already. The place that you find that information is your syllabus. That is your legal document, for lack of a better word, that you have to follow in every class. And every class is going to have different attendance policies, possibly. Even though we have a departmental policy, the class or the instructor could have a more stringent <coughs> attendance policy than the department. That's OK. Every instructor has an electronics use policy. Every instructor has a late uh, assignments policy. Make sure you read each syllabus and know how that applies to you. I've tried to list some of the uh, grading in some of these classes. So in CA 105, which is a skill development class, it tells you 85%. In CA 104, 114, 244, it's 80%. Most classes are C or better for both practical exam and academic side, but make sure again that you know what's what, okay? I already talked about see so you're better. There's one other thing, this national exams right here, um, there's two classes that you also have to pass, excuse me, three classes that you also have to pass a national exam to pass that class. Now this won't necessarily make you fail the class, um, but you'll have to work with your instructor to get an incomplete 
so that then you retake that exam in the future. For instance, if you're in uh, CA 245, Advanced Dining Room, uh, excuse me, Advanced Table Service, you have to pass Serve Safe Alcohol to pass that class. So if you don't pass that exam, you won't fail the class, but you'll get it incomplete. Now, if you don't turn that incomplete into a passing grade in a year, it will turn into an E. So you have to work with the instructor to fix that. I've worked with students two, three times to retake that exam. It's a difficult exam. The wording is terrible. They try to trick you. There are some concepts that they, they make difficult, um, but it's important law type things, and law is not easy. Um, so I'll work with you or the instructor will work with you, but make sure, again, it's your responsibility to set up the times for the retraining, set up the times to take the test, to make sure that grade gets converted from an I to a grade that passes. Advising plan. As you're working through the program, you're going to probably need some advising. And I, I asked who is on my degree path, and not very many people uh, raised their hand. So please take some time and go to my degree path and check it out to make sure you're on track. Also, there is an advising tab here on our website, okay? Everything that you need to know to, to step yourself through the program is right here. Now, you're already past step one, you're past step two, you're past step three. We are right here in the orientation. So from here down is all about you. There's pre career coaching website link. There's my degree path website link. And then there's all the different faculty that you can get in touch with to help you with, um, well, what, it could be advising for school. It could be advising for work. Anything that you need help with, okay? For instance, how many are you friends with me on Facebook? Not very many, okay? So that's one of those things that you may want to do is look me up. I don't chat. I mean, I have had students ask me questions, and I will answer them. But that's not really, not really a social guy on social media. Um, but what I do is pass along information. And the biggest part of the information I pass along are jobs. I've got well over 100 jobs that I posted. And I've had people get amazing jobs through that program. There's a couple uh, um, that have gotten executive chef jobs. There's one that uh, is at the Grandpa's Art Museum with an amazing job um, all over. I'm about to post, uh, hopefully today I'll post a job at Brewery Vivant. They need a prep cook. And they don't even need somebody with experience. They need somebody that can follow direction with a great attitude, willing to work, willing to train. And that uh, Chef Chris Weimer is doing some great stuff there. So those kind of jobs are, are always being posted to help you get into the industry. So I suggest that you, you whatever it is, friend me, um, so you can keep up with that. Um, Otherwise, if you need specific help in specific areas, culinary arts, Chef Campbell. Culinary arts, Chef Dunn. Uh, transferring students, that would be me if you're having trouble with some transfer credits. Um, if you work your way down, management, Chef Jacoby. Management, Chef Whitman, okay? So you get the picture there. And the other thing that I want to show you, because not very many people raise their hands about my degree path, is this. Oh, that's good. do it this way. So you go to your, your student login. Hopefully I'll have it this way. If not, we'll find out. There it is. So you'll find your My Degree Path. You'll get a secondary link. Now the difference between you and me is you'll get, it'll actually pull up. I, and I can't show you without a student ID number, and I don't have one that I can use because of FERPA. But you'll, it'll just come right up. And what'll happen is it'll show you all the classes that you've taken for your degree, all the classes that you need to take for your degree. And you can even do a what if. And all my faculty have been trained in this, and we're gonna go through a secondary training. So if you're having trouble with it, make an appointment for one of, with one of those chefs so you can learn how. But you can do a what if. And what that means is, let's say you're in culinary arts, but you say, ah, you know what, though, if I take culinary management, I'll be able to transfer to Ferris better and take less classes and do a bachelor's degree faster. I want to see what's going to happen if I switch my major to culinary management. You click the what if, you choose culinary management. It then changes that 
website to show you what classes you have and what classes you need for following management. Really powerful tool. There's also a scheduler in there, so you can literally plan out the next three, four semesters of your, your schooling to know what classes you should take when so that it's already plotted out, there, plotted out that way and you know ahead of time, okay? So I suggest you take a look at that. So that's the advising plan. It's also the, this, the instructors of who you go to are listed in the handbook as well. Transfer credit and articulation, I'm not going to go over that. Though anybody transfer from another culinary college, culinary credits? Okay. If you do transfer or you want to transfer out, um, you usually go to the, the institution that is accepting the credits. So if you're going to Ferris or Grand Valley or anybody, anywhere, go to that institution because I can't guarantee what we have is going to transfer there, but they will tell you what you take here will transfer there. So in, in a Ferris situation, for example, you could make an appointment right in the office there, talk to Dr. Flanagan, who's also one of our adjunct instructors, and she's expert in both um, um, curriculum, and she'll be able to tell you what classes here to take for that Ferris degree. Issues in the classroom. Hopefully you never have any, but sometimes you do. And what I want you to know about this is that there's a certain procedure that you have to follow for um, the uh, for the college. It's not so much me that asks for it, but it's a college because if the college, if you do not follow the college procedure, then I wind up having to send you back to the beginning of the procedure, and it's kind of a pain. So just want to mention this. First thing, sit down with your instructor. And that doesn't mean talking to them on the fly before or after class, because sometimes it, they just don't have the time or they don't think it's serious enough because you didn't take the time to sit down with them, right? So make an appointment, office hours, sit down, have the stuff written out, and talk to them about it, whether, talk to them about it, whether it's a grade or something that happened in the classroom, whatever it may be, start there. Very often, I would say 90% of the time, if it is reasonable and you've got a legitimate situation going on, the instructor and you can work it out. Every once in a while you can't, the instructor says, no, I'm sorry, I'm just, I need to stick to policy. Then they, at that point you have to come to me. Then I will have you write it up, we'll go over it, I'll probably meet with the instructor, we may meet the three of us, try to figure out how to fix it. If at that point we can't fix it and I say, no, I gotta side with the instructor, then you can go above my head to the associate dean. But if you do any of those steps prematurely in the wrong order, you'll just get kicked right back to the beginning. And if you do it to the associate dean, it, it sets up a bad situation because we are in a political environment, you always are, and you don't want it to be on the bad side of the associate dean when you're trying to fix a problem that probably is legitimate and you just didn't go through the right channels, okay? So instructor, then me, then associate dean. And that has to do with pretty much any concern in the classroom. Academic dishonesty. This is chalked up to unintended consequences. We didn't have a ton of problems with people cheating and, and plagiarizing and things like that in our program um, because most of you are here because you want to be and you're here learning a trait, a, a skill, and it's something that you like to do. Well, we talked about the grade requirements. And if you're just below that C, what has happened the past year or two to a couple of students is they felt pressure they got to get above a Z, and they wound up cheating because of it, which led us to have more strict academic dishonesty policy. It's very easy to check on plagiarism. Very often, uh, we will run things through Blackboard and it automatically will pull up past Blackboard. It's amazing how that works, so don't plagiarize. Um, that will get you a, an E very quickly in a class, um, and then cheating on tests through electronic devices or otherwise, another thing you don't want to do. This is how cheating and academic dishonesty will be taken care of. It's very regimented. Great appeals basically follows the same policy of classroom concerns, um, but there is time limits on that. So make sure and go to the great appeals um, process online if you do have a grade issue. You cannot grieve a grade on a project or a grade on a test or a homework grade. You can't grieve that. You have to wait until the final grade is in for the class 
then you grade the f you grieve the final grade, and then what happens is then maybe you point to a specific assignment with the instructor, and you always start with the instructor and say, listen, I'm grieving this grade, and I think I got this C minus because you gave me a D on this homework assignment, and then you can fix it with the instructor. You, again, usually 90% of the time. But follow that um, link if you need to. Attendance policy, four days in a lab, if you miss that fourth day, you fail the class. There's very little that I will do about it because usually there's very little that was not in your control. And this is what I mean. Very rarely is a student missing four days because of something that's happening to them that is totally out of their control. What usually happens when somebody misses four days is they've got a birthday party to go to or they drank too much the night before and overslept and they know they've got four days and they haven't had any absences. They're going to take one or two. No big deal. Now all of a sudden, the last week or two of class, something really does happen. And they miss the third and fourth day. They fail the class in the last week or two and then try to say, well, but I had no control of that. My car got stuck in the snow ditch. Um, I had the flu, whatever. Well, at that point, it's like, okay, yeah, but what happened in this or this absence? And then it's very apparent because usually everybody knows what happened. And I say, well, you know, you squandered those absences. If you wouldn't have squandered those absences, we wouldn't be sitting here today worrying about your grade and your failure because of absences. Therefore, I'm not going to excuse these last two. Point is, don't squander the absences. We're treating this like a job. There isn't a job out there that would let you just not show up for four days out of a seven-week period. You wouldn't keep that job, and you're not going to stay in the class either. Because at that point, you're missing way too much class time so that we can guarantee that you have the skills in that class to pass to meet that C for us to put our stamp of approval on you as a secular graduate. Okay? And then absences and tardies work the same way. Tardies bill to an absence, absence bills to that way. Uniforms, talk about course fees right now too. Course fees um, are there because any culinary program is extremely expensive. That's why the private schools charge so much. They don't get that tax revenue. They don't get some of the financial aid um, help that public schools do like we do. So we can keep our tuition very low, but we still pay the same for food. And because of that, our program is very expensive. And because of that, I have been asked to balance it out, just like almost every culinary college is do, starting to do across the nation. They're adding course fees. So now we have two. Now, the other thing is what I didn't want to do to students is say, OK, I need to pay, and you need to pay extra for course fees. And then in the second day of class, I need you to cough up another 300 for a knife kit, another two or $300 for uniforms. It just felt wrong to me. So I'm not getting as much as I should for food costs because I can't put in enough course fees to do that and not drive all of you all crazy. And I don't want to charge you twice and double ding you for any other fees. So I was able to build in the knife kits and the uniforms so that I don't have to charge you twice. But that doesn't mean that I'm actually getting the money I should for everything. Because some students have come to me and said, well, I'm paying course fees. Can I get a new uniform? Because I already paid for my uniforms in the past. Or I paid for my knife kits in the past, and you're still charging me course fees, which are supposed to cover uniforms. No, it doesn't work that way. The course fees as an aggregate throughout the program wind up paying for the things, the food and that, but not all the way. And the reason they're front-loaded in the skills and the bakery class is because, number one, they're the most expensive for food because we don't always have a good outlet for them. In the heritage, a lot of food is sold, even though we do have a lot of waste still. But in the, in the skills class and bakery class, we go through a lot of waste. Um, part of it is you just eat it, you know, because you need to build your pallets, and that's a good thing. But I can't sell it if you're eating it, and I can't recoup that cost. So, and that's also where you get most of your uniforms. And when students don't make it through the program, if I don't charge it up front, then we give away a bunch of free uniforms and then I lose money in the end because you never pay your course fees. So that's why you see this graduation. Starts out at 550, goes down to 250. I'm assured that I at least cover my uniform costs. I may not be making all the money I need to on the food, but at least uh, um, making the college happy and I'm not double dipping on you. So that's that. So 
this is the, these are the uniforms that you'll get. You're going to get a sufficient amount to make it through the classes if you take care of them. If you don't take care of them, there will be some ways that you can buy more. But again, I don't think you should if you take care of them. For instance, we're gonna, you're going to get five chef jackets. You're going to get, I think, four pair of pants. It's one for every day. You do laundry on weekends, you should be just fine. Now, if you are doing table side or something in the dining room and you only have one, one of the dining room jackets and you catch yourself on fire, then obviously you'll need another coat. <laughs> it's happened, so that's why. But we'll have that facility in the, in the library for you to buy more at some time in the future when you're in the program. But for now, you have no worries. You're going to show up the first day of class. You're going to get your knife kit. You're going to get your uniforms. Well, you're going to get fitted for uniforms. They'll arrive a few days later. Okay, So no worries on that anymore. The things that are up to you are the shoes, the socks. Please make sure they're closed-toed. I recommend a very good sole because kitchens, one of the most uh, accidents that happen in the kitchen is a slip and fall. That's where you lose the most time in this industry. Um, the shoes that I recommend very often are shoes for crews. I've tried a lot of different shoes. These are very expensive, um, supposedly non-slip kitchen shoes. Not even come close to uh, shoes for crews. It's, and it's all in the sole. Uh, I understand that they're selling that same sole in Walmart, I think, and, and Sam's Club, I believe. Uh, but you can order them online, too. But bottom line is make sure you're comfortable in them, you can be on your feet for five hours at a time, and that you're not slipping around. Uh, and make sure that if, if you are not going to get a kitchen shoe, make sure they're at least a solid surface. Uh, a black mesh tennis shoe is not solid. It's not legal. If you spill hot water, it's going to go right through the shoe and you're going to burn your foot. You need to have solid. If you drop a knife, that mesh may not protect you. So this is for your protection and, and health code. Cutlery kit is there. You'll get that. The only thing you're not going to get is a decorating kit for because every student doesn't need a decorating kit, and it's only $35. That one you'll be able to buy in the library. Also, if you need extra uh, neckerchiefs, extra hats, um, extra aprons, um, those will all be available in the library too. But you'll start out with plenty. Again, everything kind of comes back to vocational training. So we're trying to get you to understand what you need to do in this industry, and brakes kind of fall in that position too. And we're, in some cases, we're running an operation anyway, the Heritage Art and Bevs. You can't just walk off the line, take a phone call, go to the bathroom, whatever it might be. Well, that's unfortunate. There you go. Um, because we're running operations, so make sure and treat it the same. If you need a break, I'm not probably going to tell you you can't, but you need to check with your instructor first. Personal hygiene. If you stink, we may send you home. Personal hygiene and how you take care of your body is part of your uniform. These policies come from our advisory committee. They're folks that are in the industry. You're probably going to be working for them at some point in time. If not them specifically, people just like them. Unfortunately, maybe, the industry is still run primarily by a bunch of old, stodgy white guys, kind of like me. And some of them are not as liberal as I am. In other words, I really don't care about tattoos. I really don't care about hair color, as long as it's not offensive. Um, as long as the tattoos, I don't necessarily care about earrings and piercings, as long as they're health code legal. But some of these guys do. And some of them are running operations where their customers do. And at that point, that means they may hire or not hire you based on how you look. Okay, or if you get it while you're employed, they could fire you because of how you look. It's not discrimination in, in Michigan because it is an at will. They don't have to tell you. They could just say one day, you know what, I just think it's time we part ways. And that's all there is to it. So it's our duty again to train you on how to be hireable and how to get a job. And these are some of the things that advisory committee has come up with. So you gotta be clean shaven, okay? If you have a beard, it can't be over a half inch long. Um, if, you're, you have, if, you, if you have long hair, if it comes down to your shoulders, it's got to be behind this plane, tied back, or underneath the hat. Um, it has to be clean. If you have dreads, there's another one, stodgy, not stodgy. For the most part, we know that if dreads are taken care of, they're probably just as clean as any other type of hair. Or vice versa, if you don't wash your regular hair, it's just as dirty as dreads. However, that is not the perception necessarily 
of the industry. So very often people will not allow you to work for them with dreads and therefore we don't allow it in our department. Braids are easier to discern whether it's clean or not because it's usually close to the head. You can see whether it's washed or not and so we can judge on a case-by-case -case basis on whether you're clean enough in that respect. So just understand that as far as the dreads go. You gotta bathe daily. We're right here. You gotta bathe daily. You gotta not stink. It's part of hygiene. I mean, you literally could be sent home because you have body odor. And what happens if you're sent home? It's an absence. If you get an absence, trouble. If you get four of those, you know, then you fail the class. So make sure that you're not stinky. Washing hands, you should know that because that is part of sanitation. Tobacco, right here is where we are. Non-smoking campus, and especially do not smoke in your jacket. There are situations, unfortunately, where students need to smoke, and they will run out and try to smoke on campus, and then come back online, and they'll smell like smoke. At that point, you could be sent home. You'll have an absence. The other thing is they'll try to get off campus far enough to smoke, but they don't have enough time to take their jacket off. Either way, you're visible in our jacket. And then if you get caught, the directors and faculty are going to ask you for your ID, and they're going to have your name on your jacket. Because what happens is any other student that does that, nobody complains to the departments. I can't tell if an English student is smoking or not. I can tell if a Secchia student is smoking. And so I literally get personal complaints from administration saying, you need to do something about your students because they're smoking on campus. Well, yeah, but you need to do something about your students too. It's just that I can't tell who those are. So I would never complain directly to you. But to appease administration, I have said, if they ever see any of our students smoking in a jacket, they are to report to me the name. And I will then put them through the smoking policy, which is pretty stringent at uh, GRCC. Please be aware of that. Sitting on the ground. I know sometimes you're coming out of labs, there's no chairs in the hallways, so the, the feeling is you just got to rest, you got to sit on the ground. Don't do that. Your uniform is a food contact surface sometimes. You lean against stainless steel tables. You're in the cooler backing up against the racks. And if you just sat on the floor in the same floor where somebody just came from home and walked through their yard where their dog has been, you just contaminated your uniform with everything from their house to the floor, okay? Don't sit down. Grab a chair, grab a stool, don't sit on the floor. Complete uniform. If you're not a uniform, even if you forget your neck shot tie or your hat, you could be sent home. And the library is only open for certain hours. So if you come to, to school, you don't have a neckerchief, you don't have a hat, and the faculty member is going to send you home, you think, oh, I'm going to run down to the library, but the library is closed. So you run into Marsh and say, I really need a hat. Can you send me a hat? I know the library is closed. It's not going to happen. Again, personal responsibility. Know where your stuff is. Know that it's clean. Know when the library hours are. Know when your classes conflict with libraries because, library hours because you're probably not going to be able to leave class to get a uniform because the library wasn't open when the class started at 7 a.m., right? Starting to sound like a heavy again. I don't mean to. Um, undergarments, same thing. Sleeves that protrude, collars that protrude, logos that are dark or black that I can see through the jacket means that you're out of uniform. Make sure it's just a nice, plain white undershirt that doesn't hang out anywhere. Uh, when you are in uniform, make sure that they're completely buttoned. The shoes we already went through. Jewelry. What jewelry can you use in the kitchen? Only the ring. That's it. Now, that's not our rule. That's health department rule. In the dining room, visible piercings that are allowed is one earring less than a quarter inch. If you have any other piercings in the kitchen that you can't take out, like a nose or something like that, you're going to have to get a Band-Aid or something to get that covered up. Okay? And we've got this little phrase here, again, because I know that this isn't necessarily all the time in every industry, in every position, but I want you to understand that these rules about tattoos and piercings and hair color and, and all that are because we need you to understand that in an operation that is similar to the heritage, these other criteria that you're probably going to be faced with. My suggestion is, is between now and then, if you don't have tattoos and you don't have piercings and your hair is not purple or green or orange and spiky, 
don't do it in the next two years. Just wait. You don't have to be individual now. Wait till afterwards. You know, Guy, what, Guy Fieri or whatever, I can never pronounce his last name. I mean, we understand that that is the way people are going and that that is going to be acceptable across the board. But right now, we're in that transition phase. Meal discounts. Um, in in uh, Heritage, you get some discounts. Take advantage of them. Find out where you're going. Um, we want you there. And, and that's also when you're connected through Facebook, you'll see those discounts too. Sometimes we offer two-for-one meals. Sometimes I'll just put out a blurb just to people on Facebook saying two-for-one tonight because we want to put butts in seats because when you're in those classes, you want to be able to practice on your students. Guinea pigs. Theft and vandalism, you're gonna all going to get a locker. Make sure you have a lock. Come to, to school with a lock on that first day if you can. If not, by the second day when you're going to have your knife kit and your uniforms and things. Um, we have had some theft and vandalism, but it is usually, while in my tenure, in my two years, it has always been when a student either hasn't locked the lock and left it dangling because they were in class, or they didn't put a lock on at all, they forgot their lock, uh, or they didn't close their locker all the way. We've had two incidents, and, and that's what's happened. So just protect yourself. Don't make yourself a victim, okay? Thieves always take the easy way out. Cell phones, different policy in every class. Read your syllabus. Okay? Health and accidents, report them. We'll take care of you, but we don't have insurance for you. The college doesn't do that. There are plenty of areas you can get inexpensive student insurance. Check with Student Life. That would be the best and first place to check. How many have seen the scholarships online? How many have applied? Okay. So every year, we give away twice a year around $35,000, $40,000 in scholarships. In fact, since you haven't all seen that, Okay, so here's our website. Bottom right-hand corner, it's also on a blackboard, but this is easier for me to get to, is a Word document. And in this Word document, you've got, I don't know, what, 15, 20 scholarships, and we're constantly adding to them all the time. I think we just added another one this year. It'll be available probably next year. And each one of these, is the minimum is 500, the maximum is 2,500. By filling out this form, you will register for every single one of these in one form twice a year if you take the time to do it. The only thing you got to do is you fill out the data sheet, give us a one-page word process statement that says why you enrolled, your future goals, any other pertinent information you think we need to know. You go to your student center, you print out your unofficial transcript, you staple it all together, you drop it in the office of Marcia. That's it. You can register for all of these. There's the data sheet. That's all it is. So of 650 to 700 students we have in our program, Guess how many students applied for this last time in February? Yeah, there's more than 10, less than 50. But, but bottom line is, remember, we're giving away 15, 20, and some of those are multiple. I forgot to mention that. Like some of those scholarships are two and three. Um, I think we gave out three or four HEB scholarships last year. We gave away two travel scholarships last year. So there's about 35 or 40 monetary awards that come out of that list. I think we only got 45 applicants last year. So basically almost every single person that applied got some at least $500. It's crazy. And you can do this over and over again. I've had people not get it the first year, got it the second year. I've had people get it every single time they've applied. Um, not last semester, but last year, we had less applications than scholarships that we were awarding. To me, that's crazy. And that doesn't include the, I don't know what it is, $200,000 that the foundation gives away every year, because these are just our scholarships. There's other scholarships that you will qualify for that are going through the foundation, too. So please, if you're not getting some kind of money in financial aid, grants, or scholarships, take a little bit of time, because it doesn't take much. Where else? It'll probably take an hour. So where else can you make $500 an hour? That's what it is, okay? A zombie apocalypse one. Through the college? Or just out there? Really? Yeah. 
Life is Stranger Than Fiction. Yeah, I bet. You know, so there you go. Case in point, zombie apocalypse. It's like our, uh, our Ukrainian librarian. If any of you are Ukrainian and you want to be a librarian, there's a scholarship for you. That's, that's true. It's true. So you got to check it. Check it out, please. Um, student employment services. There are jobs all over the campus. If you want to work and go to school at the same time, um, you can get a job here. Uh, the department itself has several jobs throughout uh, the department. Um, Chef Luba in the um, catering services for this building um, employs anywhere between 10 and 12 students throughout the year. We've got dishwashers, cashiers, um, storeroom folks, all great jobs, great experience, and you don't have to worry about commuting. Student Life Office has a ton of things that are available. I'm going to show you the list on the PowerPoint. Um, bottom line is if you need support in some way, go to Student Life in the Student Center. Teams and clubs on the bulletin boards by the bathrooms in this building. A lot of fun stuff. Extracurricular things, things that may help you with your career. Ice carving is a great skill to have as a chef. Knowing wine and food and wine pairings to me is a must. And we do a great job in our wine class and our beverage class, but there's no way you can get all the information just in that seven weeks. So if you also come to the Sommelier Society meetings, you'll get even more. Culinary competitions, you can try out for those through Chef Campbell. Maybe get on a team and wind up going to London or Scotland sometime in the, in the future. We've had uh, I don't know, almost 20 people that have traveled for competitions the last two, three years. Um, Oh, and the ACF. I really suggest that you get connected to the ACF. It's one of those things that, that I wish I would have done when I was your age. I was young. I was cocky, though. I got a job at Steelcase. I was making ridiculous money by the time I was executive chef there. There was absolutely no reason I needed to become an executive chef. And all of a sudden, Steelcase started tanking, and I realized that I better get out on my own, so I wound up opening Sanchez. At that point, it really would have been nice to be an executive chef owning my own place. It would have given me a little more credibility, but I had squandered the time at Steelcase. Sanchez, running a restaurant, oh, forget it. I barely had time to go to meetings, let alone try to become an executive chef. Then I moved into administration and teaching, and I've been away for so long that they will not look at me for a certified executive chef, even though I've done it, done it for years. You actually have to be in the job doing it to be able to cert be certified that way. So I literally would have to go backwards in my career to be certified as an executive chef. It's one of the things I really regret. I could have done it so easily and just didn't take the time. So my suggestion is that you get involved early. You come to the meetings that are here on campus because we are connecting with the ACF. You get some mentorship on how to. Chef uh, Whitman, who runs the Art and Bev's class, um, has been a member forever, certified executive chef, and helps the, the junior culinarians start going down that path and how to be certified. Simply by graduating and paying your dues, you will be a certified culinarian. So that's going to happen automatically if you pay your dues. And in the future, um, we will have the course fees pay those dues as well. I just haven't worked out the logistics. I won't have to increase the course fees. It's just going to start happening. Um, but I can't do it right now. But I think maybe by the time you are in CA 244, which is where I'm going to try to have it, it may happen already. Um, anyway, get involved. That's the bottom line. Academic information on Blackboard, I already mentioned about getting connected, and then staff. Um, so I mentioned the fact that the master degrees, the master chefs, you all know that. Um, I didn't talk about adjuncts. You know, very often in culinary colleges, there are way more adjuncts than full-time. You might find five or six full-time faculty and then 15, 20, 30 adjuncts. That's the way it is overall in the college right now. There's way more adjuncts than there are full-time, but not true in our department. We are blessed to be able to have as many full-time as adjuncts, and even the adjuncts that we have are pigeonholed in specialty areas of where they have been trained. So ex-sanitarians from Kent County teach our sanitation class. Registered dietitian and consultant for GFS teach our menu planning and nutrition class. Um, marketing is taught by a gentleman that has done food service marketing for the past 30 years, things like that. So we've got a great team. Any questions on any of that and the handbook and all that good stuff? Okay, so 
then. If I miss a hand, hang on. One hand. So again, to reiterate, because I usually forget to really drive this point home, is there are things that I can't help you with. I talked about the procedures for grade grievances and issues in the classroom. I don't know if I touched on this enough. It happens too often than I would like. People don't register on time, they don't pay their tuition, they don't check on their financial aid, and they get dropped from the class. And then the class gets filled up in subsequent registration dates by people that don't have or haven't made it as far as you. Basically, you get trumped. And if that happens and that class fills up, I, there is absolutely nothing I can do to get you in a class. I have zero power over there. And the associate dean will not look at you at all either. So please make sure you're there on time. Know when your date is. Have your cart filled or your basket filled before registration opens, okay? And make sure that you don't miss out on the class because you haven't paid, you get dropped by financial aid, or you don't get the registration on time. Remember I said there was gonna be a list, and again, this PowerPoint is there, but Student Life has an amazing amount of services. Um, check them out. You got Raider Card access, bus passes, student involvement events, campus locker rentals, I don't need to read them to you. You can read them, but they're there. And they've got the link all throughout this document and the handbook are links to all these services as well. I mentioned those two services already. Please, if you think that you may need support in any way other than academic advising, academic advising, career advising, or if you need to hook up somewhere with a uh, job, our department can handle that. But if you need career counseling or other kinds of counseling, and that could be everything from where is there a place to live or I don't have enough money or I need help with my dyslexia or I just hurt my back or I, I don't know, anything, one of these two places will help you, okay? I already talked about the advising plan and we'll talk about sustainability in a minute. Um, so what we've covered besides sustainability is what we are, what our programs are, how you get in and stay in, right? Handbook and advising plan. Any questions before I do the last sustainability? Yeah. Good question. The question is, uh, if you're in one program, how easy is it to then and you graduate to then take more classes and graduate from another program. It's very easy right now. However, the college is looking at the fact that they don't want you doing it. it. Hasn't happened yet, so just keep in touch with the policies. But yeah, if you do the culinary arts degree and then do the culinary management degree and then go on to Ferris because more classes overlap with culinary management, you just fill in. Um, when you do that or if you do that, there are a couple of classes that kind of do double duty. So you might want to consult an advisor or a chef. For instance, if you take CA 104 in culinary arts, but then you want to do culinary management, which has CA 124, which is retail baking, I don't make you take retail baking. CA 104 is much more intense than CA 124. It's a different class, but you only need one. You don't need both. So don't waste that five hours a day, that five credits, okay? So if you're gonna do that transfer, um, make sure you know which class it takes so you don't double up un unnecessarily. But the other thing is, I, I, I hate to lose you because very often, you know, it's great to have you folks around for more degrees, but the reality is if you're gonna spend all that money on a second degree, you're probably better off spending that same money getting a math, excuse me, a bachelor's degree, an advanced degree. Because when you come to me, for instance, and I'm Sanchez's owner now, and you're applying for a job, and I've got two people fairly similarly here. One has two culinary associate degrees. One has an associate degree and a bachelor's degree. And for all other intent and purposes, they're equal. Who do you think I'm gonna hire? That bachelor's degree, right? So, and the other thing is some operations now don't even hire you if you don't have a bachelor's. And while you may not wanna be in a Gordon Food Service or a Cisco or Request Foods or anything like that now, I tell you, when you have a wife, you have kids, well, maybe not a wife, maybe a husband. When you have a spouse and you have kids, you have a full-time job and you've been working nights and weekends and holidays for, it feels like forever, and you're starting to think, God, I'd really like to move on from that and do something different. And all of a sudden, this peach of a job comes up um, at Request Foods, for instance, and this is how I lost my executive chef. He'd been with me 16 years. 
They needed a, a specialist in, in ethnic foods, which he was. And all of a sudden, after working, he was 55, I think, at the time, working, you know, all those hours, he ran across this job at Request Foods. Um, I think they made a, a re exception for him. I don't know if he had his bachelor's yet or not. But the bottom line is Monday through Friday, weekends off, holidays off, full pension, right? Who wouldn't want that job? And it was more than what I could pay him, which I got to tell you, he was making a lot of money because um, he had been with me for 16 years and we were doing well. If you don't get that degree now, it may block you in the future. I have several students in the program right now that have come back because they never finished their associate's degrees and they can't get their promotion because their job is holding them up. You can't have that job if you don't finish your degree. And that is really hard to do when you've got a spouse and kids and a full-time job and then try to do a five-hour lab or try to do classes, forget it. Okay, so kind of a two-sided answer to that. Other questions? I'm going to answer that in two ways, too. Number one, you got to know where you want to be. Do you want to be in management, not in the kitchen, not creating, not cooking? Or do you want to be that chef? If you want to be the chef, then you want to go culinary arts. If you don't really care about that chef aspect and the making of the food, but you want to be in this business because it's fantastic and fun, you want to be on the floor managing, then you go culinary management. But the other part of that is the culinary management overlays some of the bachelor's degrees better so you wouldn't have to take as many classes to go down that path okay and finally thing to consider is don't make that decision now because all the beginning classes are the same you really don't have to make that decision until you start branching off in that second year and by that time you may know already I've had people say I don't know if I want to do culinary arts or baking and pastry oh, well take them both and then sometimes go you know what? I really thought I was gonna be a pastry arts and I love that skills class so much and now I'm in chef Campbell's class I never want to go back to pastry again and they, they go, and then some people do the exact opposite. It happens with arts, it happens with management, it happens with pastry. So give yourself some time in these labs actually doing some of this work, and that'll help you make that decision. Okay. Others? Okay. So enjoy your time here. Do your best. Access these tools. And, and the main thing is enjoy it and have fun, because that's what we're all about here. All right, so the last thing I do need to leave you with is a little bit on sustainability. Again, not so much because I want to make a tree hugger out of you, but because it's the right thing to do in our industry, and our industry is absolutely horrible. And I, I want you to know what you need to do in your lab classes. So this slideshow is about two hours long. I'm not going to go through it all. But it will be posted. And there's tons of links in it if you do want to take it. I've had several students after seeing this overview come to me and say, how do I do this at my work? And basically what I tell them is take a look at the links. Take it step by step, small little steps. Don't try to do it all at once. It took Sanchez literally a decade to get where they were, where they were, where they are. Um, and start with something simple. Maybe it's just LED bulbs. Maybe it's just com composting. Maybe it's just swapping out the paper towel from bleached white to non-chlorine brown. I mean, whatever. Small little step at a time. All right, so the main, main thing is to reduce our waste in every single manner. Um, everything that we do affects the earth, and you really want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. As I said, the, the um, food service industry is one of the worst. How much do you think that we waste down the drain? Now, these are figures from the average um, restaurant. Think of Sanchez as the average restaurant countrywide. How much water goes down the drain washing dishes, thawing food? 800,000 gallons of water. That's, not, that's one restaurant. There's about 400 in the metro area in Grand Rapids. I think there's five thousand or five or four thousand, probably more now. I haven't checked figures, but in in just West Michigan, multiply that by four thousand or just four hundred. It's astronomical, and that water is just down the drain. Um, 
I think it's like 16 years for a family of four, to give you an idea. 80% of our waste of electricity is gone, uh, excuse me, of energy, electricity, and gas. If you think about it, what's the very first thing you do when you walk into a restaurant? Turn everything on. How long is it before you actually start cooking? Sometimes it's a couple hours. The, the new equipment these days, maybe 20 minutes heat up time, warm up time. You don't need to walk in at 7 in the morning, flip everything on when you're not going to open your doors until 11. Have a scheduled maintenance program. And the other thing is you turn the hood fans on, what's it doing? It's sucking out all the air conditioning. So now your air conditioning has to kick on or your heat. You turn the pot on. How many of you go in and one of the very first things you do, because you never know when you're going to need that pot of boiling water, you put a pot of boiling water on the stove and turn it on and let it boil away all day long. Do any of your chefs still do that? No? Oh, thank goodness. That's just something that a chef used to do. Ten years ago, that was the very first thing. Turn the stove on, turn the oven on, put a pot of boiling water on, because you never know when you want it or need it. And, you know, the flames lick up off around the, the pot and the heat just goes right up the flue. So $8 billion we waste every year, 80% just up in the air. But half a million kilowatts an average restaurant uses every year, and it's equivalent to these figures. Every restaurant. This is just one restaurant. Okay. How much of the greenhouse gases, in other words, how much of the, the um, carbon dioxide and the methane is the food industry responsible for? And it's, just, it's not just restaurants, but the entire food industry. When we think about greenhouse gases, we're talking about manufacturing, we're talking about cars. Anybody have an idea? Higher. It's about 33%. So the things that we eat, the way we get our food, the way we survive on this planet produces about a third of all greenhouse gases on the planet. It's pretty bad. Gas, two billion BTUs, that's two million cubic feet. So a cubic foot, about yay big, of gas. We use two million of those every year in an average restaurant. Again, I think it's like eight or nine years in an average home in Grand Rapids. Every week, we throw away about 25 yards of trash. This is about 25 yards of trash. It goes in Grand Rapids, either the incinerator, and when they've got too much trash and they can't burn it because it's too much, they send it to the landfill. At Sanchez, we've taken that much, and the front end of that front end loader is about two yards. We send about only two yards or less per week to the landfill. We've reduced our solid waste by over 95% through composting and recycling and reducing it before it even comes in the door. So think about hydroponics. It's one of my favorite. Um, I don't even know if we still do it, but we did. Uh, we worked with a local greenhouse, and they would deliver their microgreens in the hydroponic trays, we just stack them up in the cooler. When we need them, we harvest them. When we're done, we give them back the trays. Zero waste. Isn't that cool? With the bakery we worked with, we bought them the big 12-gallon Cambros. They deliver the bread in the Cambros. We use the bread, give them back the Cambros. Zero waste. So you, that's the very first way you can do that, and it's a huge part if you start thinking about that. Mentality of people, though, is amazing. GFS came up with a paper towel that was rolled tighter same number of feet, and they compressed it into a smaller box. I forget the astronomical amount of savings in trucking because, you know, it can fit more cases on the truck and all this stuff. Their customers rejected it because it looked like it was smaller, and so they had to now sell both products, the big bulky one that everybody's used to because of their mentality state and the new compressed one for people that really want to reduce waste. It's, it's information. It's education, and that's why we're doing this. Oh. One of the things about this composting is it's cheaper. The tipping fee, which is the fee that, that the garbage haulers charge you and the fee that the um, incinerator or, or uh, landfill charges you, is nearly twice as much or a third as much as the composters. So at Sanchez, I save $4,000 a year just by composting. So not only is it good for the earth, it's good for my pocketbook, and a lot of this stuff is for that reason. So as I was saying earlier, if you're not going to do it because you're, you want to do things good, do it because you're going to make money. And if you make your company money, you'll make more money. You'll excel in this world. 100,000 pounds of trash a year. And I'm going to blow through this pretty quickly. But bottom line is if we recycled, we could eliminate 21% of our coal-fired power plants. This is the what you want to do. First, not even have it come in. 
then reuse it, don't let it leave, recycle it into something else, and then compost it, and then the last two you really don't want to do. We do composting here. We're probably about a 75% separation rate. What that means is in the kitchens that you're going to be in, there are going to be three containers. And if you don't make a conscious effort on what goes where and take a little bit extra time to get used to it, you're not going to separate well. And I could walk into any kitchen in any given day and see paper towel, for instance, thrown in the yellow can. I'll tell you about the cans in a minute. And what that means is somebody didn't take the time to walk that yellow, um, excuse me, to walk that uh, paper towel to that yellow can. That's all it is. You didn't take the time. The student didn't care or the instructor didn't enforce it because they're teaching you skills. Sustainability is secondary. So we only separate about 75% um, as opposed to like Sanchez at 95%. I would like to up that rate. Um, this is an actual picture of Zealand. They have all this topsoil in this covered area. They bag it, they resell it to greenhouses, they resell it to places like Lowe's and other garden houses, um, hundreds of thousands of bags a year. Uh, they have these huge, big rows of basically compost. It starts out as trash, and then they rotate these huge rows. They're 10, 20, 30 feet high. They're, I don't know, 100, 200 yards long, and there's several of them, and it's like a, a compost farm, and they rotate them through. And by rotating them, keeping air inside of them, those compost hills actually maintain a temperature of about 180 degrees. So it literally is digesting the food, just like you and I digest and turn it into um, carbon dioxide and water. That's what happens to the food. But it's less carbon dioxide than methane, and the methane is produced because there's no oxygen, and that's what happens in a landfill. And it's 23 times worse in a landfill than in compost. And the people in a landfill are saying, we're green because we're making energy out of the methane that's coming out of our landfills. We shouldn't be producing it in the first place. It's not green. That's kind of green washing. That's like BP saying we're green. There is nothing, I don't care how green BP will drill, how sustainable that they will find oil in this earth, there is absolutely nothing sustainable and nothing green about anything that has to do with oil and gas. That is greenwashing, right? It just isn't. You can't spin it, and there are ways that people spin it. So if you're going to do this, do it sincerely, do it right. All right, <clears throat> so what are we doing? We do recycling, we do energy reduction, we do green roof, we do sustainability courses. You actually can get a degree or a minor, so to speak, in, in sustainability and go on and get a four-year degree in sustainability, which in food service might become pretty valuable at some point in time. We do community projects. We have an advisory council, um, and other efforts are there. What we're doing in SICE is we're doing waste reduction, energy conservation, local sourcing, recycling, and composting. I'd love to do more local sourcing, but the fact of the matter is it's more expensive, and we're on a strict budget. I can't just raise prices to make up for local food like I can at Sanchez. Nobody here you know, at Sanchez, don't tell anybody said this, but you know, the fact that we're selling, I don't know, beans and rice for $10, I, I, I don't understand that sometimes. But people pay it. A lot of it's local, cool stuff, but I can't do that here. And, and not only that, I can't recoup money. So if I spend twice as much on a local bean as I can through a non-local bean, I just lose more money in the college. So that can't happen. I'm kind of hoping that with the, the, the course fees, I can argue the fact that I can just lose more money. So we'll see more and more local sourcing. Um, but a lot of times you'll, in your labs, the reason I'm making a big deal of this, and in your labs, you'll start saying, well, why don't we get this local? It's fresh right now. That's why. It's all about money. We do recycling and composting. At Art and Bev's, we're going to go all compost this year. Um, we've tried some dine-in serve, serve uh, uh, washable trays, and unfortunately, a lot of customers are walking off with them. So we keep going back and forth on whether we use them or not. Um, they just don't return, which is unfortunate. So while it may be more green, it winds up costing us more money. So that, that's a negative. Um, in labs, you're going to see a green can, which is all mixed re recycling. Now, the one thing I need you to know with the recycling is everything can go in that can, just a quick rinse because we don't want bugs on the loading dock, but everything can go that has a symbol except if it's styrofoam. Even if it has a six and it's a black plastic six, hard plastic, it can be recycled. If it's the white foam and it's a number six, it can't be recycled. It's a one thing. Now, hopefully, we don't have any of that in our department anymore, but sometimes foods come packed in it. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, don't need to separate it. It all goes in there. Um, 
We don't have a lot, so it's not a big deal. Organic is red. Um, anything that was once living goes in the red can. Now in your labs, you may not have to use those big cans. You may have a little hotel pan that you work in your station. At the end of the day, you'll pour that in. You may have a little bitty red bucket, personally, because we don't want to slow you down by having you do something and have to chase down a red can and come back to the workstation. So you may work in your own area, and at the end of the day, you'll take care of the compost. Basically, anything that was living, this is saying anything that was living can be composted. So just think about that. Paper was once a tree, cardboard was once a tree. Anything that is food was once an animal, it was living. It was alive, compost it. It's not the same as a home garden compost. Bones, beef fat, scraps of meat, all that can go to this composting. You don't have to worry about it. There's no vermin issue. There's no problems with rotting because these piles are 180 degrees. It literally just kind of digests it and burns it up, not with flame, but with composting. Um, if it's a rock, if it's plastic, if it's scissors, no. That's not paper, that's plastic. Um, these are things that can't be um, composted. We do recycle batteries, though, uh, around the campus. Um, anything else that doesn't follow those two categories goes in a yellow can. If you're in any lab, you should not have more than one of those cans filled about this much. Because the only thing that's going in there are plastics or maybe contaminated foil um, that doesn't have a symbol on it. Everything else is compostable or recyclable if you're doing it right. If you see anything that was once alive, like hand, paper, towel, or anything in there, we're not separating well. Every once in a while you'll hear Chef Campbell scream about that. These blue cans, I want you to know what they are, but I would prefer you don't use them because if you contaminate even one piece of paper in a big full bucket of the, this with uh, office paper, they will just throw it away. They won't take the time to, to compost it because it's not our department. It'll wind up in the waste stream, and I don't want that. It's better just to compost paper and cardboard. And there's some studies out there anyway that say that it's more environmentally safe to compost paper products than recycle them, especially now that we have these renewable forests we're doing, although not everybody's doing that, um, because of the chemicals in the water that's being used to recycle that paper. I don't know. It's, we're still out on that. The judgment is still out. But bottom line is I don't want to contaminate and cause more waste. So just recycle it. Same with cardboard. Batteries are throughout. All right, the last thing is take the time to separate returnables. Um, there are about $2 million in Michigan of returnables that don't get back to Pepsi and Cola, or Pepsi and Coke and others. And in the past, they would just pocket that. You, know, you pay them up front that dime, and if they don't get that bottle back, they get to pocket that dime. And we do it so often that they are making literally millions and millions of dollars on our laziness. There's a new law out where they kind of get audited and they have to pay some back, but I don't necessarily trust that that's going too well and they've got so much lobbying power that it probably isn't returning them. So take time and get the returnables in that bucket. And this is just some stats I won't bore you with, but those are how many things per year that don't get recycled or returned. Okay, so what do we gain from this? Again, you're going to increase your efficiency. You're going to gain money. Um, used to spend about $90,000 in electrical and gas costs at Sanchez. I spent thousands of dollars on uh, LED light bulbs and um, the gas uh, uh, equipment and the LEED certified this and that, not LEED, um, NG Star um, appliances and things like that. It cost me quite a bit, um, but my energy cost now is down around 70000 And I started doing this, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. So you do the math. Like an LED bulb pays for itself in a year and a half. So that means for the past 10 years, I've been making $20,000 a year in lowered energy costs. Do the math. So if you don't want to be green, that's fine. Don't do it for that. Do it because you're going to be well off or more well off because of it. The other thing is, and there's different um, figures out there, and then this figure right here I use. It's actually a negative comment because this restaurant consultant um, media person says there's no reason to spend all this money on going sustainable because only 29% of your customers care anything about it and only 29% of your customers are going to likely patronize a green restaurant. Like, wait a minute. How many sales dollars do you think I do at Sanchez a year? And we're not huge, but we do all right. We do $3 million a year. If 29% of my customers didn't care or didn't know I was green and they were going to go somewhere else like Bella Vida or one of the other places that do a great job of sustainability, what does that mean? 
That means a million dollars of my sales are gone. That's not significant. And this guy's saying, ah, it's only 29%. So I'm using this figure against him and saying, if you can gain 29% of your customers because you're going to advertise, you're sustainable, and these are the practices, and you do it with sincerity, yeah, that's worth it. And this figure is from five years ago or so. So it's probably even more than that now. So those are a couple of reasons to do it. This is how you get into it. And then the rest of the slide presentation I'm not going to go over. But if you want to know more, you want to try to get your business to do it or your boss to do it, there's a ton of information all right here. Okay? And it goes through all the different processes. So any questions on any of that? Um, probably not um, growing produce here. Uh, the yeah, um, I would want to try to do something with greenhouses. Um, it's very very early, trying to work with the market, and maybe we can at least have some kind of partnership there. I would like to talk about doing some sort of greenhouse, maybe with a Meyer Garden partnership. Um, that is. At the top of my list. In fact, when this program was developed 20 years ago in this building, the amphitheater and the greenhouses were part of it. We ran out of money, um, public funds, you know, as they are. So that is still on the list. I don't know how long it'll take. Um, it took 20 years to get the amphitheater because um, it's pretty. But maybe with the partnerships and the changing attitudes, it might be sooner than later. But it's on my list. In the meantime, I'd love to start up our tilling for table, a tilling to table student group again. I've got some interest. We've got a garden up at the McCabe Marlowe House um, that used to be t tended by the student group, and so people could learn and be a part of it that way. The problem with that is our growing season is opposite of our academic season. So it, when those students graduated, there wasn't anything there to pick up the next fall because you have to start over, and it was a bunch of students that were in their senior year. So at some point, I'm working on that as well, but um, it's not very sustainable in the sense that students come and go. What else? Anything else? Again, I'm not trying to be on my soapbox about the sustainability thing, but I think it's important to our industry, and I think it can make you some dollars and it will make you a better chef in the future. Anything else that has come up since I've been talking about that, about any, any of the other policies or anything like that? Thank you for hanging in there. I know that to sit there and listen to me talk about all this stuff the entire time is not always the most fun because, again, you're like me. And when I'm in your situation, I go out like a light because I want hands-on. So I appreciate hanging in there. I appreciate that you are going to know where that information is and you know how to get a hold of me. If you ever need personal advising or something with me, you can go through Marsha, make an appointment, and get on my calendar. Otherwise, you know all the emails for the other chefs are there as well. And, and keep in contact with those chefs as you go through the program. They're awesome. If there's no other questions, we are good to go. All right. Thank you.